committee, we have a great uh, first string substitute, Sharon Jin, and our city clerk this morning. We thank you, Sharon. I know it's a, a special day, and uh, we're the last time that I'm chair of Arts, Parks, Health, and Aging Committee, so I want to thank everybody involved, and I'll formally thank uh, Richard, our city clerk, who's on a different assignment today, as well as our city attorney, who's not here. I'm joined by Mr. Reyes, the great councilman of the first district, and let's take some of these items up uh, right now. I want to get those... Uh, I think it's at four and five. There's a prop. Uh, uh, you wanted to push those ahead, I'm told, so they get the, we're working on it right away. Okay. Item number four is a LA for Kids Steering Committee report relative to a Vermont West, Western Station neighborhood area plan, Parks First Trust Fund grant award for the Hollywood Public Garden and Achievement Center project. Item number five is LA for Kids Steering Committee report and resolution relative to initiating proceedings for the 2012-13 Proposition K assessment. And that's for citywide. Let's just take number four first. Uh, is anyone here to speak on number four? Mr. Chair, yeah. I thought she said, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Madam Clerk, you say 2012 13, because in my calendar it's 2011 2012. Uh, yes, Council Member. Unfortunately, uh, there was a typo. The uh, correct uh, um, fiscal year should be for 2012. So I want to make sure it's on the record. Yes, sorry. Okay. But we'll correct it for the report for Good Council. council. Mm hmm. Uh, Neil Drucker, one of the top city engineers. Neil, give us the report. Thank you, Councilman. Good morning. Neil Drucker, Bureau of Engineering. And the Bureau recommends, as did the LA for Kids Steering Committee, that we award a grant from the Parks First Trust Fund in the amount of 984542 to the Hollywood Public Garden and Achievement Center project under the SNAP Ordinance Funding Program. Just to let you know, this is about a $1.7 million project. The agency has funds of its own that it will contribute towards the overall project cost. The project will acquire a parcel located at 1171 to 1177 North Madison Avenue and turn it into a community garden. Okay, good. So uh, Mr. Garcetti supports this? That's correct. Great. Okay, so on number four, we recommend approval. Thank you. Right, Mr. Reyes, you okay, number four? Yes. Sir. Number five, wait, Neil, okay. just on five, two, just give us the rundown for the record. Sure. And this is just our annual report to initiate the 2012-13, and that number is correct, 2012-13 uh, annual Prop K assessment. This is actually a year-long process, uh, which begins now. Uh, in late October, we will be convening the annual RVNOC process, Regional Volunteering Neighborhood Oversight Committee, where we bring in com uh, citizens from all over the city to help us decide on the projects to fund next fiscal year, as well as how much to fund each year. So you're an experienced uh, administrator. What's the difference between the people who are the VNOC mm -hmm. and the people on neighborhood councils, and is there a connection there? Uh, what we try and do, they are sometimes the same people. There is a connection. In fact, what we try and do both at the regional level and at the local level is bring in neighborhood council members to our RV Knox as well as our LV Knox for a couple of reasons. One, they tend to be the folks who are very interested in their community, obviously. Two, they know the parks and the communities around the parks. And three, by bringing them in early on in the process, by the time we do have to go to the neighborhood councils for our projects for their approval, the neighborhood council is already knowledgeable about the project, and at least some of the members have been involved with the projects from day one. Very well. Thank you. Mr. Reyes, any questions? No, no questions. Okay. Recommend approval on number four and five. Get back up to work and make sure these things get out on time. You got it. Thank Thanks you. so much. Uh, thank you very much. Let's do item number one. Item number one is the city attorney report and ordinance relative to amending the Los Angeles Administrative Code to establish a new general admission fee schedule for the Los Angeles Zoo for fiscal year 2011-12. Hello. Good morning. Lewis. Please give us a little report. All right. Good morning. Uh, 
John Lewis, General Manager of the Los Angeles Zoo. Uh, this is our uh, fee ordinance that was part of the 2011-12 fiscal year budget. Uh, we're just now getting to it and would appreciate your support on this. We're looking at a $2 increase across the board uh, for uh, admissions at the zoo so that we can uh, uh, balance out our budget. Now, not this committee, but the Budget and Finance Committee was trying to squeeze you to charge for parking because they did. But you felt in order to charge for parking, there'd be a need for infrastructure and cost. And if this modest adjustment at your admission was made, it would cover what the pressure on the Budget and Finance Committee placed on your department. Is that kind of correct? Well, I, I think that's all true, except I don't think they tried to squeeze us. <laughs> they asked us to look for all possible revenues. We did conduct a fairly extensive study on what all the possibilities were. So we have that in place if in the future we ever have uh, the money to include some infrastructure. What we were left with was charging for parking at the gate and for a lot of reasons, most uh, related to customer service, it seemed to make more sense just to charge the additional fee across the board versus trying to ask people at the gate, did you park, you know, how many cars right. did you bring, all those types of things to keep the lines moving and still achieve the revenues for the fiscal year. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Just a couple of questions. Uh, in previous discussions, as we went through the process of assessing fees and looking at all these changes that we're going through, there was a, a dialogue that we had where I asked what were the impacts, what could be the impacts of local schools, mm -hmm. especially in, in impoverished areas, places where you have 40 percent out or below poverty population bases. Um, do we have the ability to identify where the students come from, the populations that do go to the zoo, so that next year we're going to ask you for a report back see what kind of impact this fee increase is having. Uh, I know it's minimal. Mm -hmm. I know we're going through dire straits across the board at all levels of government. But it doesn't take away from the need to understand the notion of access right. for these families. So how do we begin without adding more burdens to your daily routine? How do we establish that ability to identify impact in, when it comes to access? Well, it's a great question. And, and if you want, uh, Mr. Chair, we can uh, address item three as well, which right. is the report back on the question that you previously asked. Right. And uh, for the record, uh, just uh, roll two and three, call it. So we'll roll it all into one, and then we've got to ask all those questions. Item number two. Uh, Three. Oh, Item I'm three. sorry. So I'm going to have her call all of them. Okay, so if you have I'm a question sorry. about two. Item three. number. Oh, okay. Item number two is a city administrative report relative to uh, an amendment to a contract with Portico Group for the Los Angeles Zoo Living Amphibians Invertebrates and re uh, Reptiles Exhibit. Item number three is a Los Angeles Zoo report relative to the number of. Los Angeles Unified School District school group visits to the zoo. Okay, to continue to answer, uh, and, and it doesn't add a burden. We do keep track of those numbers um, at the zoo. Right now, the uh, scheduled tours to the zoo from LAUSD, uh, there is no charge to the students for that attendance. Their biggest uh, issue is transportation. Uh, we do have a small grants uh, funding. I think it's about 20000 a year that based on first come, first serve, where the schools that really have the need, uh, they we can help them with the transportation cost. And I appreciate Glaza's support in that. I know they are very active and, and uh, generous in how they support that aspect of it. And then uh, schools that are not part of the LAUSD <coughs> district, uh, the students, I think, pay $2 uh, per student. Is that $3? $3, I'm sorry, $3 per student. Uh, but if a, if a school comes to the zoo without scheduling and just whether it's a field trip or just on their own, we do not have those numbers and we don't have a way to, to gather them. So uh, we do try to keep track of that to make sure. So this fee increase doesn't apply to the school fees. So theoretically, it shouldn't have an impact, but we will track those numbers. And, and if we see some change, you know, try to respond to that. So the, the bottom line is the population base of the students will not be impacted by this at all. Yes, sir. But there will be an impact to families who want to come in right. 
And that's a number that's hard to determine, like where people come from. No, we, we, I'm just saying if they're, if they're coming as part of a school but they don't take our tours, we can't keep track. But we do keep track of the visitors and the, the zip codes where they come from. So we're able to track them generally where, where they're coming from the city and how that changes. So, Mr. Chair, if possible, could we have a report back that's in six months, then again at the 12 month period, just to see what this is causing? Maybe we find out we, attendance. Yeah. right. Okay. And we find out we, we can still increase it. Right. Uh, maybe we're not, we've got to find that sweet spot. Yeah. <laughs> like, All right. It is a good report uh, that we just tell the schools, which I think we should distribute. Right. Make sure all our council, when we get to council on this, just so that they know the cooperative spirit that you have. So on uh, number three, and then, and, and OLA Unified pays to come. The Zoo Magnet School comes in there all the time, yeah. uh, as it is right there. Uh, do you have numbers back? in time like 10 years ago on you on know, school groups no because the, uh, and back you know 10 years ago they did not keep track of school groups because you did not have to make a reservation so you know i can remember when we used to have that bridge and those kids would just, just line pile up, up on the bridge. On it. you could just come with no reservation right. so we don't have those numbers but we've unfortunately been seeing a downward trend in school groups but that doesn't have to do with our cost but just their school buses and, and their ability to, to right to get out of the classroom get out of the classroom exactly. to get a test all the time but in that um the whole infrastructure of the school system is changing. You now have a whole group of charter schools. Do they fall under that same umbrella? Yes, if they're affiliated with LAUSD at all, they are entitled free admission to the zoo. And we make all of the schools aware of the scholarship opportunities that we have um, in August and they're gone in, in the same month. Uh, so the schools know that we have them. We just probably don't have enough scholarships and might get more more students in classes if we had more because the transportation cost is really, really high, $800, $1,000 to, to transport kids back and forth. How about parochial schools that are situated in impoverished areas whose families are impoverished? Do you have, you've got these struggling uh, parochial schools um, in, throughout the I know on the south side and southeast and, and east side. They are eligible for another um, group of scholarships that we call ZooPals. So if they can't afford the $3 per student that they would be paying, there's another pot of money that's available to those type of schools um, as well. And we have various criteria, which is similar to how we award the transportation scholarships. You know, Title I school, more than 51% on um, free or reduced lunch, and or um, the this number of students um, that are uh, English as a second language so we make those scholarships available as well to the non LAUSD schools that might meet that criteria do they know about that yes we they tell do? them all and let me tell you it's but it's a small amount of money we wish it was more and right. we spend it like in the first month that it's available we've awarded all the scholarships that we have wow. okay thank you if you ever want an uh, enriching experience, come volunteer at the reservation office that first week of school. And right. <laughs> phones are going crazy. <laughs> okay. So uh, just to review, Madam Clerk, on item one, we're going to um, approve uh, oh, okay. that. Is that all right, Mr. Reyes? On item one, you had yes. no problem. That was in the budget. That goes forth there. Item number two, the contract. Uh, you have no problem with that. Any, give us a little word on that. Can I get the yeah. BOE up here to speak to that, please? Right. Full recovery from your, oh, where you, where your knee, was it your kneecap? No, I actually uh, fractured my femur. Femur, okay. Right, good. good morning, it's Rebecca Bono, um, Zoo Program Manager for, with the Bureau of Engineering. What you have is an amendment number two to the portico contract. It's the design contract for the living amphibians uh, and reptiles, invertebrates and reptiles exhibit at the zoo. What it does is it adds $23,000 in fees, which is within the approved budget for the project. And the reason we're coming to City Council today is we're extending the contract beyond five years. We're extending it from July 30th of 2011 to December 31st of 2011. 2011? 11. To the end of this year. End of this year. Thank you very much. Okay. And uh, how many projects do you have at the zoo right now in construction? In construction, we have three projects. We've got the reptile in construction, the um, rainforest of the Americas, and we're also doing the gorilla waterfall pipe replacement. And is that the end of the construction project? It'll be the end, yes. Of the Okay, good. Thank you very much. Yes. Right now. Very good. Okay, good. So, Mr. Reyes, any problem with that? No. Recommend approval. And lastly, on the uh, report, 
requested in six months. This committee get a report on that, and we'll do that. Thank you. Have a good day at the zoo. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Say hi to everybody out there. Okay. Okay. Uh, is the representative from uh, Recreation and Parks here who could speak on item number six? Item number six is motion Labange Garcetti relative to the Department of Recreation and Parks establishing a volunteer in the parks program. Give me a brief that I'm going to call public comment and then I'm going to call you back. Um, well, Councilman Kevin Regan, Assistant General Manager of Recreation and Parks. And uh, as you know, the Department of Recreation and Parks has a very extensive volunteer program. We have uh, currently 25,000 registered volunteers. Those are volunteers that have uh, been through the department's registration process and have been fingerprinted and are uh, not necessarily all currently volunteering at the same time, but they're within our pool of volunteers. Most of our volunteers are obviously uh, coaches. Um, we have a lot of volunteers that work at the various rec centers to work with seniors, to work with kids, it, you name it. Uh, but we do also have a lot of volunteers that uh, work out in the park doing uh, cleanups uh, at the park or at the beach, doing tree plantings, a number of these types of activities. And we also work very extensively with Volunteer Center Los Angeles, and, and we do have a, a, a very um, vibrant court referral program in which uh, misdemeanor offenders ha can be sentenced to community service hours, and they can come and do those types of hours in the, in the park. So we have all of those different programs. In conversations with you uh, a week or so ago in your office, I understand you kind of want to expand that so we can have like a volunteer core of folks that are willing to do maybe possibly like tree plantings or cleanups or maintenance activities or docent activities in the parks. And uh, we can certainly look into trying to uh, uh, expand that type of a program. We don't currently have that, but we do have all of those other opportunities. Great. If you could hold for a minute, we're going to public comment. Tom Williams, Joe Young. Mr. Chair, the time? One or two? Oh, you give him two minutes. Two. Okay. Uh, Dr. Tom Williams, El Sereno, LA 32 Neighborhood Council Board Member. And we would like to propose a slight change in the name. Maybe make it Neighbors in the Park. Because most parks, the volunteers will be from the local neighborhood maybe even walk in. In El Sereno Recreation Center, we had 50 people come out at various times to help clean up the park before the finale for summer night lights on this last Saturday. So we're there. We're already there. Those people came to the neighborhood council and said, can you help us? We helped. So it's a matter that you already have a lot of volunteers right now. Say roughly 8,000 man hours a month in volunteers through the neighborhood councils. Have the Recreation and Parks Department coordinate with Dunn and or the 95 neighborhood councils in order to coordinate because most of the neighborhood councils have a sports and recreation committee a beautification committee, an environmental committee, and they are particularly fond of the parks. So you already have elements there that are available. And 50 people working maybe two hours a time spread 500 cubic yards of mulch on El Sereno Recreation Center in a matter of yeah, about three weeks. So it works. It's already there. But make it neighbors in the park. L L.A. does not have to use the feds or the state terminology. We have neighbors, and neighbors protect their parks. Thank, Thank you. you for your suggestion. I disagree with you, but I like volunteers because it tells people, not you, who's always there. It's someone who may be inspired, and the word volunteer tells them exactly, hey, I could do something. But thank you very much, Tom. Yes. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Mr. Reyes. My name is Joe Young, and I'm with the Friends of Griffith Park. Um, 
Um, my comments are really about this item, but also items 11 and 12. But rather than get up and down three times, I thought I would just say it once. Uh, first of all, uh, regarding uh, volunteers, many of our parks are regional parks, and they appeal to a much wider audience than just local neighbors. Uh, Griffith Park, in particular, is millions of people come from all over of Southern California to enjoy the park. So it isn't really just local neighbors. It's uh, everybody. Uh, my main question is, is I have some questions about uh, uh, who is a volunteer and who gets to be a uh, uh, in the Ranger Reserve program. In other words, all the entities that uh, can help out Rec and Park in this time of, uh, of physical austerity. We don't really have enough Rangers to do the work that uh, we've normally expected. Uh, who sets the criteria for uh, who can be a volunteer, or who can be part of the Ranger Reserve program? Uh, who can apply for those jobs? Who evaluates uh, the people that uh, are requesting uh, 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 to become uh, volunteers or to become uh, part of the Ranger Reserve program? That's my question. Thank you. Very good. It's a very good question. Uh, Madam City Attorney, thank you for pitch hitting today. Uh, the, the Recreation of Parks, the Parks of Los Angeles, under the jurisdiction of the Recreation of Parks Commission. Is that correct? Correct. And they would follow guidelines <laughs> that they would develop as they already may have in place. I know there was a challenge some years ago, I think, at Echo Park, where you really went over everything. And I was at a back-to-school night where they went over everything as far as people taking a background uh, orientation on the proper values you have when you volunteer or when you're on a school site or if you're on a, uh, a playground site, coaches, uh, code of conduct, all these things. There's a variety of the things, Joe Young. I don't know if the Sierra Club requires that. For their members? Yeah, good. So it's similar to that. But uh, if you could uh, answer Mr. Young's <coughs> questions, Mr. Reagan. Um, I'll, I'll answer it in general terms. He asked a number of questions, but in general, regarding volunteering for Department of Recreation and Parks, in the Department of Recreation and Parks is subject to not only commission policy, department policy, policy set by the general manager, but as well as state law. And there is state law that uh, speaks to volunteering in a park when there's going to be children in the area or working with children. And if uh, any volunteer is going to be in the proximity or working directly with children, they have to be fingerprinted. And there's a number of different um, background issues that would cause a, a, a person to be disqualified. There's a number of different criminal offenses that uh, if the person has those in their background, they cannot volunteer for the Parks Department. Um, and also um, uh, other types of issues. So there is a thorough background done, a fingerprint check done for all registered volunteers with Recreation and Parks. Those prints are sent to Department of Justice, uh, California State, and they're screened. They come back through our uh, HR, actually, through our Human Resources and our volunteer coordinator. And then if, the, if everything is good with the background, then the volunteers are approved and approved volunteers have gone through like a registration process and they have some status. They're not employees. I think it's important to know these are not jobs. These are uh, volunteer positions and they're uh, basically at, at the will of the department. Volunteers can be asked to do certain things um, within the scope of their particular duties and they can also be asked not to do that if things aren't working out. So there's no hiring, no firing. Have you ever had to remove a volunteer? We absolutely have. Well, what could be an example? Just on a well, a good example is uh, a coach that gets a little bit okay. Well, let's talk about the one who's taking care of nature. Okay. Like, is anyone out of line when they? Well, we um, yes, we have had individuals uh -huh. that um, you know I don't want to give any particulars, no, but no. Uh, we have had situations where we've created some like volunteer docents that their primary function was to. Um, provide information to the public about certain things and, and some of those things had to do with like do's and don'ts at a particular park like you should do this you really can't do that and we had some handouts some flyers um, created we gave these individuals a t-shirt and actually at the time because it was really hot in the summer we gave them a hat that said you know city of LA volunteer and some of the folks got a little bit overzealous and started thinking that they were kind of like police and they really John weren't. Law. So we got into some issues and we had to remove those. Yeah. So, yes. How much does your department 
and I know you can't speak for the commission, how much do you value volunteers? Oh, gosh, I mean, the Department of Recreation and Parks couldn't survive without its volunteer program. Right. If you think about it, again, 25,000 registered volunteers, that's right. the largest number of volunteers for any city department. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, again, L.A. City Recreation and Parks, one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, parks and recreation department in the nation. We provide numerous programs that we do not have staff to put on that program. Right. Um, for example, our staff very seldom coaches the teams in which the community members' children often play. Those teams are coached by volunteer parents for the most part. They are not always parents. Sometimes they are teenagers themselves that are right. coaching the team. In some cases, we have volunteers working with our summer day camps. We have volunteers working at pools. We have volunteers working at senior centers. Uh, you name it. My uh, coach just died, Mr. De La Grotta. He was 96. At I Lemon still remember my coach yeah. from Eagle Rock. Yeah, uh, Lemon Grove Rec Center. Mr. Reyes, any questions? Okay, what I'd like to do, when we come to council, I want a one sheet uh, that talks about your 25,000 and that you, that you do have programs. And if there is, let's say, a neighborhood cleanup in a park, yes. you don't check everybody before no. they start cleaning. But if they're in a neighborhood rec center and they're teaching crafts or someone's teaching photography, you're going to make sure the person teaching photography has qualified and does have a background check. To Correct. Leave it. On these one-day cleanups when an yeah. organization comes in, a business, uh, whatever, um, we have an exemption for that. And we have staff that stays there with them to monitor the activity. Yeah. Mr. Reyes? Yeah. The issues that uh, the chair just raised uh, does bring home a, a point that I just wanted to drill down on. When you mentioned we have volunteers who are coaches, um, what kind of structure do we have in place that gives these individuals, it's, it's a, a tremendous influence on children, the, the character and, and the presence, if you will, uh, judgment on how to treat children and how to influence an environment where rules are being taught. Is there a, uh, I'm assuming we have an orientation for them. That's correct. And so do we have any other nonprofits that would be in a position to enhance that aspect of it? I've had people come to me and, and ask me, how did that coach get that position? Or right. why do they allow that person to behave that way? Uh, it, it's a gray area because it's, it's, it's a cost issue, it's a personnel issue, but yet it's a very critical phase of our experience in, in the park. Do we ever have it, other nonprofits supplementing or, or supporting us in how to train the coaches and train the trainers, if you will? Well, um, uh, yes, we have done that in the past. We are currently doing it. Just to, to let you know real quickly, the department does have a program in place. It's a commission adopted program that is a policy of the department is called Character Counts. And the Character Counts program was developed uh, in collaboration with the Michael Josephson, Josephson Institute. This is an institute that studies uh, character building in children and, and core values and things that the kids need to learn. Um, so we have an entire program that uh, the rec directors go over with each and every coach. Um, and every year when they start, like say they're starting up basketball, they get all the coaches together, they have several meetings, they go through the Character Counts uh, program, they talk about all the different aspects of the program, the things that coaches should and shouldn't do. And uh, they even do a little bit of, of on some of the sports training too. Like, you know, you think every coach might know about the sport, but they don't always. So we do right. some training on, on how to coach the sport. We do training on how to be a good coach, how to build character in children, how to, in particular, how to deal with parents of the children and how to, and how to um, ensure that the parents are behaving properly as well. And all the, um, the players, the coaches, and the parents have to sign an oath that um, says that they will abide by the rules of the character count. So if I were to ask the park director to give me a list of the volunteers who went through this experience of being orientated towards best practices and how you influence children, I can get the list from the park director? If you went to, yeah, if we were at an individual park and we asked the director for a list of their coaches, volunteer coaches, and the ones that have been through a character building program, they should be able to provide that. Also, oh, it's not mandatory. Um, you know, it has been mandatory in the past. We're going through, uh, we're going through a new uh, 
like we're rebuilding the program right now. Um, John Muckrey is very much involved. And it is uh, the character counts uh, oath and the training, the preliminary training, is mandatory. However, there is a much more broader program that we used to do and that we're building back into. Is that it? That I like to follow up with you on that. Yeah, and the information much. we Good. can give you, provide Thank you. Thank uh, you, Miss Dodge. Uh, your card was mixed with other cards. I apologize, Marion Dodge. Item number six, public comment. <coughs> Excuse me, Miss Dodge. Good morning. Uh, no problem, because my comment is actually uh, Marion Dodge, friends of Griffith Park. Comment is is similar to Joe Young's about what are the criteria for uh, volunteers and also the same question for the upcoming uh, major reserve program. But I also wanted to ask who is the person who decides who qualifies and who doesn't qualify? Well, again, we're mixing questions, but I'll talk in general about the about volunteers. The at, at the recreation center where the bulk of the volunteers uh, um, are assigned. The recreation director selects the volunteers. The volunteers then go through the, the screening process in which both uh, a designated person within Recreation and Parks Human Resources screens those applications and gets the results back from the Department of Justice because they're confidential and our volunteer coordinator. Recreation and Parks has a full-time volunteer coordinator who coordinates all volunteer activities. Primarily, it's department staff that chooses the volunteers. Remember, volunteering is not is not a it, it is not a job. It's not an interview. It's not a right. It's not something that someone can demand to do. If the department has a volunteer opportunity for a particular type of service, and if the department is seeking volunteers to do that, then department staff will interview and screen those volunteers and choose the ones that are appropriate, and then put them through the background. If they pass that then they'll be available for those volunteer hours. And that would apply to everything from a, a ranger program. Do you have a, on your website, do you have a thing, volunteers, how to we volunteer do. and what to we do? do have a, we do have a, uh, a, a, num, a, a, we do have information on our website regarding volunteering, yes. Well, I think you're going to have a robust conversation when this comes to the council. Maybe Mr. Muckery could be there, Mr. Sanders sure. as well, to talk about it. So we'll move this along to council, which is the value that we have. I do believe the National Park Service is a model to look at, and I do believe the Recreational Parks of Los Santos has always been in the forefront, so maybe we could marriage those two. Thank you very much, Mr. Reagan. The next item we're going to have, would you read that in? Item number seven. Item number seven is motion lesson Weezar relative to naming the park. Pocket Park located at 1015 South Wilton Place as Country Club Park Heritage Plaza. And Mr. Wesson's deputy is here, and we also have from uh, uh, Melinda Geyer, yeah. Recreation and Parks Planning Associate. Um, just real briefly, the um, Recon Parks does not have um, legal ownership of this parcel yet, so we're not able to take action on this motion until we do have actual until the property has been transferred from the CRA. But just in terms of general process, uh, what we do is we will take the motion and ask our commission to grant us a conceptual approval, make sure that there's no issues starting out. Then we would engage in a community input process. And then if when we have consensus, then we'll go back to What the if the CRA gives you a piece of land that they have a name on? Uh, what, what we, what, we, we would why would you even have to worry about it? We would, we would have the option, if, if it are, was already named for some reason, we would probably keep that name unless someone requested that it be named something else. Right. Uh, most of the time when we go through a naming process, it's a new acquisition that has not yet been named. What our department has the ability to do Keep going. is to uh, like assign a temporary name, and our preference is to use a geographic, either the local street or the local community name, until such time as a formal request for naming is made. Right. Uh, for the record, state your name. Uh, Ed Johnson with uh, Councilmember Wesson. Uh, the, it's a vacant lot, so there's no name. Um, it is located in the Country Club Park area. Right. So I don't. No, we don't see any issue with the proposed name. It's just that we cannot start the process until our department actually has legal ownership. Can I pose? It's in the process of being yeah. transferred. So we're trying to make it easy for you. Can I pose the question this way? Sure. If it's a vacant lot. Mm -hmm. Who owns it now? CRA. CRA, yeah. Uh, hypothetical, if CRA named it now, mm -hmm. you can accept that as, as, as named, correct? 
We would have that. I mean, there's there's nothing saying that we have to go through a naming process. We like to because we have to order the signs and put it up, and we want to be able no, to No, but let's just say it. the CRA grants it to you for purposes as stated. It's already named that name. There should be no issue, right? I don't believe that there would be an issue with that. Okay. The, uh, the, the purpose of the motion is to communicate the request. Right. Um, Got it. Which you can rack and stack until such time. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I drove by this park, and I was proud of that park, and I saw a sign there. You don't even have to make a sign, so drive by and look at it. So let's move it forward to council. I think the councilman knows that. Mr. Ray, you have any questions? I just wanted to say, Melinda's correct in that the department, she couldn't take anything to the board to change a name, but I understand what you're saying. If, yeah. it, if it comes to us with a name, that's the name. Right. Got it. Okay, good. Good. Yeah. good. Thank you so much. See you later. All right. Next item. Item number eight is a um, motion LaBonge Caretz relative to a report from the Department of Rec and Parks and Los Angeles Police Department on quality of life issues for the neighborhoods surrounding Runyon Canyon Park. Thank you very much. We have Mr. Reagan and Captain Gramala from Hollywood. You can give us a brief report. We have a lot of cars that I want to hear from the public, have an opportunity, and then try to get some next steps that would help. And I know, Mr. Reagan, when I've talked with you, you've talked about environmental issues that are very important and park management issues very important. And, uh, Captain, uh, from your response, uh, we'll take that input in. Mr. Reagan, please. Yeah, just real quickly, Councilman, I'd like to um, – I've, I've framed this issue to you a number of times, not only in your office but here in, in public, uh, in your committee. Um, so Running Canyon, a uh, uh, very large park uh, – and, and as you know, practically the entire park operates as an off-leash dog park as well. There's a number of issues. A lot of the issues um, that the community uh, surrounding the park are experiencing have to do with quality of life. They have to do with um, folks that are coming to the park. It's a very, very popular park, so lots of people come. They bring their dogs, and oftentimes they don't follow all of the rules. So um, people will, some of the things that will happen out on the streets in the communities is that parking is a very, very difficult issue, particularly for residents. They find it very difficult to park even in their own neighborhoods, uh, even in front of their own house, or even sometimes it's hard for them to get in their driveway because there's so many people sometimes illegally parked. Um, there's lots of people walking up and down the street, sometimes running their dogs off leash before they get to the dog park. That's another problem. Also, a lot of folks allowing their uh, their pets to uh, go to the bathroom up and down the street is a huge problem. So, And there are some environmental issues within the park regarding people that are what we call trailblazing. They're not staying on, on uh, designated trails, so it's causing a lot of erosion, et cetera, et cetera. Those are some of the issues, some of the things we've done about it. We've had a number of community meetings that have been chaired by your staff in collaboration with the mayor's office. Um, LAPD has been at all the meetings. We've had park rangers there, Office of Public Safety, Animal Services, Recreation and Parks. To the best of our ability, we've tried to mitigate some of these issues most recently by um, ha holding a number of joint task force uh, during the weekend on the weekends with Animal Services, LAPD, Office of Public Safety, Police, park rangers, um, I think that covers it. And we've had all this, all these groups together working on all the different streets and in the park writing a number of citations, citations for illegal, par oh, DOT, I'm sorry, this is a parking violations, off-leash violations, uh, dog licensing <coughs> violations, um, urinating and whatever. You know Chase Park? Yes, in, yeah. in the valley, yeah. Right. And how busy is that? Is that an off league dog, dog there? Or, uh, it's, not a, it's not an official not off league dog. Okay, dog good. Park. Okay. We're going to ask the captain to speak, then we're going to ask yes. the public to speak. One question I want to ask you directly. You said the whole park is an off leash. Well, area. the entire, almost the entire but park. But it's used for that way. Should there be a strict discipline on the, on the prescribed area? That there'd be no off leash dog till they get to the off leash area? Well, um, you know, we've had a lot of brainstorming sessions, and I'll just say, in my opinion, one of the things that I think we should look at as a group moving forward is that we have had this um, this very, very large off-leash area for many years, and I think that maybe it's time to look at um, narrowing that down and reestablishing maybe for a environmental reasons for environmental reasons, establishing a designated off-leash area that would not encompass the entire park. All right, thank you, Captain Gramala. 
Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I think the two main issues that we're talking about here are the quality of life and general civility that has changed within the area. And part of that, uh, in large part, is due to uh, the Internet, social networks, and reality TV that has basically made Runyon Canyon now the place to be uh, for celebrity sightings, meet and greet, uh, the new dating service, whatever you want to call it. It has totally changed the complexion of that area. As a result, the majority of the quality of life calls, emails that I get are from the residents who've lived there some 30, 40, 50 years and have seen that area change dramatically, not only with traffic issues, but, you know, just the general civility. They can't walk out of their homes. They can't just walk down the block without somehow uh, having some negative interaction with people that uh, in large part are visitors to the area. And in addition to some of the issues that you've just heard with regards to dogs off leash, et cetera, um, you know, the calls for service come up there with great regularity. At night also, um, we have many issues with regards to people coming in into the park off hours. We know that resources are limited to deal with public safety issues up there. But I have even assigned uh, my officers to help General Services PD in locking the solar gate and opening it each and every morning. A resource basically, you know, I'm, I'm ill-equipped to, to basically donate for this purpose. But every single morning and every single evening, I have officers doing that from LAPD Hollywood area mm -hmm. that it's really not their responsibility. Mm -hmm. But we're doing that to try to help alleviate many of the very, very legitimate concerns of the residents because they also are fearful that the, a fire may ignite in there. You have people making little campfires, et cetera. So there's, there's public safety issues, fire issues, and quality of life issues that we really can't ignore. Thank you very much. If you could vacate your seats, Susan Davis, Lee French, Don Andres, and uh, Edward Nesselbush. Please come and sit. Hi, please. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Eddie Nessa Bush, and I moved into the Runyon Canyon area about seven years ago, and I've seen a huge increase in its usage. Um, the Runyon Canyon hike doesn't begin at the Vista Gate or the Fuller Gate entrance. It begins in front of our homes, and our streets have become the parking lot for Runyon Canyon. With that comes people removing trash from their cars and just throwing it into the gutters. On the parkway, um, in front of my house, or all of our homes, but it's a very narrow parkway, but it seems as I walk out my steps and I go down <laughs> daily, I'm greeted with dog poop in there. And on a weekly basis, I'm scrubbing the light pole because it's right there at the corner of my house in the driveway. And to get to my car, it's that daily smell of urine. So as a hiker and a runner, I don't even use um, the Vista entrance anymore, especially during the hot summer months, because the smell is just, it's overwhelming to me. But I've noticed more so that I'm now dodging on trails. I go through the Waddles Mansion to do my hikes and my runs on areas, trails that are not, were not that used before. And I'm not finding myself dodging poop that isn't being picked up. And have witnessed occasionally people off to the side using it, you know, the hillside of the bathroom because they got to either do their business. So thing my thing is just something has to be done. Very good. Thank you very much. I'll go next. No, I'm going to call Lee French. Oh, okay. Thanks. Oh, we, do you mind? I, I would defer to Don to go okay. now. Okay, my name is Don Andrus. I live on Franklin Avenue, and I represent the, as the president of the Homeowners Association, approximately 175 residents uh, in our neighborhood adjacent to Running Canyon Park. And I'm here to make three points. <clears throat> We're basically dealing with a business, Running Canyon Park. It's estimated to have 10 to 20,000 hikers per week, over 3,000 dogs per week. This is a large business. <clears throat> it is noted on every, as uh, the captain has said, every website, reality shows, blogs, etc. There are no public facilities and there is no parking in the park. Second point, as a result of this, the neighborhood 
has become an extension of the park. Everything that people do in the park, either legally or unlegally, illegally, results in <coughs> massive losses, lawlessness in our neighborhood. All that is documented in the handouts I've provided to you. We have a list of eight health and safety issues uh, dealing from everywhere from congestion in the streets, traffic uh, laws being ignored, leash laws ignored, all the things that the captain talked about. In addition, maybe she's not aware of these, but illegal use of handicap signs by hikers that are more muscular than Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, lately, it has been even more aggravated by hikers urinating and defecating on our personal property. And this is not a single occurrence. This is a routine basis. And lastly, property damage and invasion has occurred within the last <coughs> month. If I were running a business like Runyon Canyon Park, you, the city of LA, would shut me down. And maybe that's what needs to be done. Third point, the only recourse we see is <coughs> to eliminate the health and safety hazards and the lawlessness is for you to close the Vista Street gate, have an emergency entrance only, grant residential 24-7 parking without permit. May I finish? I'm almost done. Please. And continue with the excellent ticketing of the traffic and parking violations. We feel that these three things need to be done immediately to avert this situation that has become unbearable and to prevent the ultimate accidents that are going to occur in the neighborhood resulting in multi-million dollar lawsuits to this city, which we do not want to have to pay for with our tax dollars. Thank Lee you. French, please. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, approximately four to 500 dogs a day, hundreds of gallons of urine are being deposited on our streets. Uh, before today's meeting, I counted over 30 piles of feces in the immediate area of my house. I have been attacked. I've been sent to the hospital. I've called Grimaldi, who made reports on people invading us and coming into our house yelling and screaming. The venue begins at 5.30 in the morning with yelling, laughing, barking. It continues through the day and on the weekends. It is never ending with often 100 people an hour, dogs uh, and feces and yelling and people using Vista Street as a third street promenade. You cannot honk or, or toot at any person politely without getting shot the finger, thrown water bottles at, screamed at, told to move, including my neighbor across the street who his dog was killed in front of her by a, a, a dog walker whose dogs got off the leash, including the woman down the street whose, whose baby was attacked in the carriage. I'm going to read very quickly the letter from uh, my neighbor who could not attend today because this is so overwhelming to him, he began to have such a, a, a stress attack that he couldn't attend. He says, about 49 and a half years ago, my wife was conceived on Vista Street. I moved here in 1985. I moved here in 19. 70 something right in the middle of the creation of the first covenant with the city about Runyon Canyon Park. The park master plan created out of extensive meetings with residents in the city reassured a skeptical neighborhood that our quality of life would not be diminished, would in fact benefit by the park's development and there would be no impact on human health and safety at all or an impact from noise. Well, it didn't quite happened that way. We didn't quite believe that. At a subsequent meeting dominated by Vista neighbors, we disputed this rosy assessment and demanded reconsideration of egress at Vista Gate. We were ultimately ignored and the gate opened, although without the recommended parking lot to alleviate the even then acknowledged existing problems in the neighborhood. Thirty years later, we were right. Our worst nightmares have come true, true in tenfold. In addition to the litany of daily hourly complaints you hear today, our mental health has been negatively impacted by the three decades and dozens of meetings in the Runyon Canyon runaround. Parking lot design meetings, parking restriction public forum meetings, Runyon Canyon Park Advisory Board meetings, Park Advisory Board Urgent Issues you meetings. You could paraphrase that so everybody could speak et cetera, this morning. Et cetera, et cetera. I guess to conclude, we are being chased away from our own homes and our beautiful historic neighborhood, and we are the people that moved into Hollywood who bought up the house from, 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 the, from the rundown areas. We were all rundown houses. We're the people that took pride in Hollywood. We moved in. We created this beautiful neighborhood. We are still creating it. It is being destroyed. We're being destroyed. I can't okay. go. Yeah, I got that. I got that. But, the, but, but if I recall, 
the land was purchased to prevent a development in the first place. In 1980. Right, but it never was developed properly as a park with all the amenities that now call these problems. Absolutely. Ms. Davis. Thank you. Well said. Okay, I'm Susan Davis. I, I live in the 1700 block of Gardner, just south of Franklin. First of all, thank you so much for listening to our concerns today. Um, there's two things that I wanted to talk about that are really pressing, as I'm a mother of two children, two young children, they're under three. And the neighborhood has gone from being more of like an adult neighborhood, like an adult neighborhood, Hollywood neighborhood, to it's really a family neighborhood. Since I moved into the area four years ago, uh, the number of young families and children has tripled. Um, the two things I'd like to talk about are traffic safety and dogs off leash on the streets, on our, you know, our streets, not just the park. Um, on Monday night, I went out, I was walking my dog and I happened to have my iPhone. And I w um, had my baby on, my youngest, in a baby Bjorn. I was trying to cross the street and as I crossed the street going north, crossing Franklin, Four cars ran the stop sign there. So I got out my camera, my phone, and I filmed for eight minutes and 53 seconds. 31 cars went by. 19 of them ran the stop sign. One of the three stop signs. Blatantly, I have it on videotape if you'd like to see it. The second thing I'd like to talk about is the dogs off leash in the neighborhood. The dogs, the off leash part of the park <clears throat> starts when they get out of their cars in front of our houses. I just want to list a few things that have happened to me in the short four years that I've lived there. I had a dog run into my house while I was playing with my baby on my front porch. I had the front door open. The woman laughed about it and thought it was funny. She didn't see the concern for my child. I have, um, when I was pregnant, walking up the block with my daughter, I mean pregnant, walking up the, dock with, up the street with my dog on a leash, um, I was pushed over. I was jumped on and pushed over by a pit bull that was not on a leash. And then when I, you know, obviously upset, got up and said I was pregnant, I was yelled at by the man, the owner of the dog. Um, I'm going to stop now, but there's count because the clock ran out. But there's countless stories. These people are just not being respectful. Well, the one thing that's it's happened to every neighborhood in Southern California, 70% of our growth is in basing, meaning neighborhoods that I know, and I've been with the city 30 seven years that were primarily older neighborhoods of older people are now uh, uh, blended with a lot of youth, a lot of children, a lot of babies. So I understand that completely. We did alter the Franklin Avenue light to prevent the cut through. So those 19 cars, they were either visitors to Runyon or residents who are your neighbors who may live in apartments. And We'll, we'll let that, we'll, we'll, I want to see that tape later on. Let me call the next group of people. Joe Young, Marion Dodge, Dietrich Nelson, Susan Mullins. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Joe. Okay. Good morning again, Marion Dodge. Uh, every once in a while, a phenomenon occurs that creates a new word. We had mansions, so we got the word mansionization. We have Runyon Park, now we have the word Runyonization, because the effects that they've described there are spreading throughout the other parks. We've already had incidents at the Commonwealth Gate to Griffith Park where there were some 23 young people at 1.30 in the morning. They'd been cavorting up in the helipad and came down and half of them got lost and they're drunk and creating all this racket. And uh, then we had people who decided it would be a good place to play baseball in the middle of the street while you smoke cigarettes 100 yards from the no smoking sign and drink your 18 pack of Bud. So I think what you need to do is you need to aggressively address the issues brought to you by the Runyon Canyon people so that the contagion does not spread. We don't need Runyonization of all of our parks. Thank you. Joe. Good morning. Uh, Joe Young with Friends of Griffith Park. Uh, I second uh, what uh, Marion just said, and I'd also like to say that uh, the, you're going to be developing a strategy <clears throat> for dealing with, with Runyon Park. Some of the <coughs> elements of that strategy can be, will have to be applied elsewhere. For example, areas around Griffith Park like Ferndale or Commonwealth, uh, which uh, unfortunately 
can promote uh, uh, rowdiness. Another thing you want to consider, especially regarding Griffith Park, is uh, should the city be promoting activities which themselves attract late night rowdiness in Griffith Park? Uh, next month will be something called the Haunted Hayride, uh, which is a month-long uh, uh, fundraiser. And yes, it does bring in some needed money uh, for Griffith Park. But it, by its nature, it is encouraging people to come into Griffith Park late at night and just by human nature, that's going to inevitably lead to uh, uh, rowdiness and misbehavior. So I think you want to you want to think long and hard about promoting that type of activity in Griffith Park and any other park. Thank you. Susan. If I could yield to Sure, Dietrich, sure. I'm the three the for sleeper. three today. Three for day. Okay, Thank we got you. it. Dietrich. Hi, my name is Dietrich Nelson, and I'm Area 6 Chair for the Hollywood Hills West Neighborhood Council, which includes Runyon Canyon. For the past year and a half, I've made Runyon Canyon a priority they met with people, uh, members of CD4 Rec and Park, stakeholders uh, on the, the north and south ends of Runyon, who bear the brunt of the overuse and abuse of Runyon Canyon by its visitors, both human and canine. Runyon was once an urban oasis, but now is blighted, is blighted and being overrun by visitors. Rogue trails have been created throughout the park and on private property, creating erosion problems and impacting the environment, where grass and vegetation once grew in Runyon is now barren dirt. It's become an environmental disaster. It's also draining the resources of LAPD because of car break-ins and LAFD because of accidents of guests to the park. I've advocated that the park either be fully closed or closed in sections of the park for extended periods of time to promote regeneration. I've also talked about charging visitors so uh, to provide funding to help the park. Many ideas have been floated, but no action has been uh, implemented. Runyon is considered a maintenance park without a budget. There are no bathrooms to service the thousands of visitors a day who hike the trails and, limit, and the limited parking of Mulholland. Trails are not maintained, the paved roads are, paved road is eroding, and park services dumps palm fronds and dead brush over the edge of the paved road, uh, creating fire hazards. Overall, the park is a disaster. Enforcement of pet on leashes in the designated areas have been attempted. Citations have been given uh, to those breaking the law only to be thrown out by the courts by judges who see the whole process as a waste of their time. There must be a unified effort and coordinated uh, by all departments of the city of Los Angeles to make drastic changes immediately before it's too late. Thank you very much, Susan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I actually, I'm with Upper Nichols Canyon Neighborhood Association, and I could go through a similar litany of these, but I really want us to look forward. And this motion of forming a, an advisory board does that if, in fact, the council is willing to be bold, if the council is willing to have courage, sort of that Michael Bloomberg kind of courage that's willing to say, hey, city, people of the city, visitors to the city, we have to do this different. And I want to just appeal to you in supporting of this motion of this, that you give it some kind of real decision-making power and that you bring to the board, create a full vision that's holistic, that doesn't just respond to my neighborhood or any other neighborhood, but the fact that we have this space that is wonderful that was created for the right purposes is out of control, but we can do something. And you're going to just keep having people come back being angry if, in fact, you don't say, this board will be different. This advisory board really will get something done. So it is with that that I thank you for doing this board. And let's go Give for it. it. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Mr. Reagan, can return. And, Captain, if you could return. And Dave Ahern. 
the head of field operations for the 4th District. Could you get at the table? Yeah. Mr. Reyes, any uh, questions? Okay. Basically, uh, this is the district I represent. And I uh, always like to try to achieve greatness for the people of Los Angeles. Because without question, as Mr. Reagan stated earlier, the overpopularity of this land has caused it to overwhelm the neighborhood that exists. And the topographical, it's not flat. It's a hill. It's a canyon. You have two uh, streets, basically, Franklin and Mulholland. Much has to be done. I need recreation and parks to rethink and regroup. Maybe someone from planning section. I know Melissa's here. The Mike Scholl's group, uh, and because it doesn't have a building on it, so there's not the infrastructure of staff that's there. You have uh, gardener caretakers who come in the morning and do general work, but there's nobody doing aggressive work. We have to, and this is the thing too, with a community process, uh, I truly believe, uh, look at the environmental closures, as Mr. Nelson spoke of and others spoke of, that need to be. We have to talk to animal services because it is overwhelming. Uh, it, it, it take over the street, which would be here. Hello, it's St. James City Attorneys on us in the midstream. That's good. Uh, so on these things here, Kevin, what do we uh, have as far as a park advisory board there now? To my knowledge, we don't have one. Okay, so we have to create one. How do we create one? Well, that would be something, I mean, Councilman, respectfully, these types of, all of these types of issues that the community is asking for need to be addressed. But right. I think we also need to understand that recreation and parks has to have the staffing and the ability to do all of this. This is a hillside park. This is not a park that is intensely maintained. Like no, but what's the problem with recreation and parks is you're poor when it comes to natural lands. But it's but if the city puts a building on it, the CAO will give you 12 right. positions. Exactly. So so this I is one of the to, things that you have to rethink. But I how you do it, because here's my failure. My failure to, to these people, I haven't been able to deliver for them. And so what I need, though, is to try to regroup some people. I have Mr. Ahern, who's the head of field operations for the 4th District, who's a 30-year veteran of park services from Glendale, which I'm offering up. We volunteer in our office to engage okay. what I need from Record Parks what, to say I, that we I'm, could create something. What I'm trying to say, Councilman, is that this... The one thing that I totally agree with the community on, this is not s solely a parks issue. Right. This is a city family issue. And when we've had a number of meetings, that's why I was adamant about animal services, DOT, LAPD, Office of Public Safety, and of course, Rec and Parks has the Rangers. Those are just some of the law enforcement and rule enforcement agencies. I mean, people are not acting right when they're coming to this park. That That's a social problem. Okay. So... Recreation and Parks could certainly put together some type of an advisory board. It's going to be a very difficult and long process. It's going to require a lot of staffing. And we we have yeah. severe budgetary issues in this department. Yeah, okay. Let me just, uh, uh, Mr. Reyes suggested a task force, which is a, that's a what term. I, that's that what I would suggest. Okay, let's look at a task force to think that you can do this. Because much has been studied, much has been written about, all has been said. So a task force that has like a 90-day operational thing, because some of the DOT issues, first of its kind, I want to ask that the DOT have two-hour parking on the diagonal parking exactly, the park. on Franklin Avenue to have turnover parking on there. My fear for the Bureau of Engineering was is if we had parking up the Fuller Gate that we would have a $10 million to $20 million wall, because I don't believe the road was wide enough, and somehow in the excavation it would have caused more expense. All these things laid into it. So we could create a task force, thank you, Mr. Reyes, for that, yeah. with objectives and have the neighborhood council, the neighborhood, and also post a real uh, uh, firm, uh, and maybe ask someone to come in and give us a, I don't want a citation, but to give us a, a report card that the environment there is being harmed, <clears throat> whether it's the Bureau of Sanitation to the drains at uh, Franklin and Vista or at Fuller and Vista or whether it's the uh, state lands, agriculture district, whatever, because the soils have been challenged to the great degree. Comfort. And also, we also have had another problem, too, just right there, Ed, in a second. With Lake Hollywood still closed, it won't be open until next year, some have found running as an alternative. And then also, the state does charge for uh, the state park, which is in the vicinity in Studio City, which sometimes people don't want to pay. It comes there. And I don't know if we ask or experiment in the pilot population, 
do would we even think of charging to if there was money going there to maintain it and and everybody's life was improved and do we make it smaller for the dogs because it does there's nothing left from the soil so exactly councilman i agree with you so there are there are these greater issues and then there's these issues that recreation and parks that recreation and parks commission would have to address in terms of in terms of the long term planning for the park right. whether or not we reduce the size of the dog park um, those internal issues the environmental issues and you know issues about the the restrooms i mean if this park was designed to be kind of a hiking park uh, a hillside park and now it's becoming just much more populated so the things we need to look at and then put right. budget numbers next mr reyes has a suggestion thank you ed when uh in focusing on a task force, uh, there's some fundamental information and data that is a border plate level. Um, and I want to ask the LAPD. Uh, Captain? Yes. Uh, Captain, when we look at allocation of resources in a presence of police cars and or coordination with DOT, traffic police, motorcycle officers, um, do you have enough data to speak to the hot spots where these stop signs and or these intersections uh, are uh, essentially being uh, ignored? Stop signs, uh, people, we have pictures here, images of people sleeping on yards, defecating, uh, urinating. Do we have a track record and or an account of how many arrests and or citations we made? We, we do have a recordation of that. Again, as they say, freedom isn't free, and the environment of freedom and a free-for-all that has become uh, Runyon Park and the environment is very costly to all of us in the city family. I have to no, I, echo I, that. I do have, you know, I have my regular resources. I have my basic car, my senior lead officer, West Traffic Division, et cetera. But those are not infinite resources, and they're pulled but, throughout the division. But what I wanted to suggest that in terms of a task force, if through coordination with the neighbors, if we create a team approach, working with LADOT, uh, start specifying certain hours where there will be a presence, that the community will know you'll be there, and you believe to have a level of, of dialogue where that coordination really comes down to a schedule. Um, and, and I'm more than happy to do that, and I'll, I'll totally cooperate with the input from the community. Again, however, though, the task force is a Band-Aid, and I think the issues here that have been brought by this community, um, the task force will be good and we'll go rah, rah, rah for 90 days. Well, no, right. you're you're actually, all the neighbors are, are shaking their heads. Here's the thing. We don't go out there. You, we, we can't go out there and all of a sudden implement change uh, without some record, okay? A record was placed by your public comments. And we have to have a process. And I know Mr. Andrews, is that correct, is very uh, frustrated with his dealings with the city, as Mrs. French is. But now we're at this point where we have a record. And now if we put some action together, and it does take days, we should do it. But, and then just to build, just, just, no. to, just to build up on, on process. And again, I'm just reflecting on other neighborhoods. I got, hey, Lee, Lee, if you want to speak from there, we're not going to finish the meeting. So I'm just saying, here's the time right now. That's why we put it on the schedule right now. Okay? We're not going to, if you believe that we could go out there this afternoon and change it all, we can't. Okay? This is the start. So structurally, when you look at these kinds of records and data arrests, then, it's up to the council and the stakeholders to start looking at issues that I see in writing. You know, does the street closure make sense? Does a one-way make sense? Does infrastructure change make sense? But that's where consensus building comes. And as many groups that are here, people that are here, there might be others that think differently. Who knows? But the fact is, there has to be a database to work from, and I'm not sure we have that or not. I have one other suggestion. So. I truly believe that we have to deal with the issues around, you know, in the communities around the park. The parking is paramount. Whether or not certain gates are going to be open or closed, those decisions are paramount, right? There are things that recreation and parks can do within, internally within the park that we, we also need to look at, and those are kind of, that are attracting all the folks to come. Number one, again, we've already talked about, do we redesignate the dog park? area. Um, then, and I mentioned this to you before, Councilman, 
Recreation and Parks has a whole series of ordinances that we can use to, to um, you know, take care of the parkland. One of the things that we don't have, and I was reviewing in the 6344 series in the municipal code, is we don't have an ordinance that allows us to close certain sections of the park for uh, environmental rehabilitation. Well, we did that during Griffith can, Park's we can, fire. We can do that as an Five emergency. years ago, and now it's come back to menace. We can do it as an emergency measure, as okay. we did in the case of the Griffith Park fire, right. where the commission took an emergency action to close that section. But in terms of a closure, a routine closure just uh, in a particular area to refurbish or to let it grow in, we don't have that ordinance. So right. what I'm suggesting is this. Um, Again, it goes back to resources, but Mike Scholl, as you know, has a great planning staff. Um, if you were to ask uh, the general manager to have uh, Mike Scholl working on some planning issues in terms of, you know, the long-term utilization of the park, whether or not we shrink the dog park, looking at the trail restoration types of issues, some of it's already been done in a master plan that has been worked on before. Maybe some of that needs to be updated. But I'm just saying it, it, if it is a, it's a, if it's a holistic problem. I got that. But if we did something within a 45-day, 60-day period, where let's say we said today, September uh, 6th, okay, by the 1st of October, we line up everybody that should be in this task force group. We go out there. We make assessments. We post signs. They say change is coming. Okay, to protect the lands, we have to do these things. We're going to restrict the off-lease dogs. Uh, from anywhere in the neighborhood through to where the first gate is. Uh, and things of this nature here. That's what we would need to do. So what I could do from this committee right now is ask that on this particular matter, uh, that we note and file this, that we instruct the council deputy to convene a meeting, uh, with our office and everyone who wants to be involved and to take a step that you said that tries to control it and even issues beyond the park which is the DOT, right. which is some of the LAPD problems. I'd just like to add, any task force, it's going to be incumbent upon us to have park rangers, general services PD, right. and animal rigs, but in, in some, in some uh, respectable fashion, not just one or two people showing up there, because that park is their responsibility. Uh, it's unfortunately not primarily LAPDs, and you know we, we're busy enough outside of that area, as the community said, because the park has become an extension into that community. So I need those people to plain come to the table. Right now, I'm closing Solar Gate. LAPD's responsibility is not to close the Solar Gate. I'm putting my resources day and night to do that. I mean, I need some some support here. Correct. And it's not coming. I got that. I'm just curious. Uh, the number of people that have increased, is it because there's more people living in each home or is there more people coming in from the outside? No. When we've, when we've looked at it, you've looked at the demographics, the zip codes, where are these people coming from? You run license plates, DMV checks, where are these people coming from? Primarily from the valley, they come as far as Redondo Beach. It is the hot spot. It's the it spot, for lack of a better term. The social media. Absolutely. Yeah, folks are coming from all over. But we could use social media to say that on certain days there will be patrols, uh, you will be sighted, you will be towed, you will be. You could use social media to your advantage as well on that end. Right. And I agree with both of you, and I agree with the councilman that we kind of need to publicize some of these rules are coming, change the rules, make yeah. it a little bit try to encourage people to act uh, appropriately. I really take some personal responsibility. Okay, thank you. So we're noting and file this with that action. Uh, I'm going to continue this meeting. If anyone on other issues, if you would want to wait, those who came down, I'll be happy to speak with you personally as your council person. But we're going to note and file this, uh, Madam Clerk, and we're going to create a task force to, like a 45-day task force, and also say, due to, due to Kevin, what we do need to look at, you talked about that municipal code series, that areas of the park will be uh, restricted due to that. That includes those hiking paths that you feel are, and other things that are causing the challenges right, to the I think environment. It's part of the okay, need good. To look at all that. Thank you very much. Next item, Madam Clerk. Thanks. Next item is number nine, and that is the Department of Recreation and Parks report relative to the status of joint use agreements citywide and within Northeast San Fernando Valley and current programs at LAUSD sites in each council district. Yes, Kevin. Uh, good morning, council members. Kevin Regan, Assistant General Manager, Recreation and Parks, once again. Um, just to give you a quick report back on this, 
as you know, in June of 2011, uh, Vicki Israel of our Partnerships Division reported to this committee regarding some of the joint use um, efforts going on between Recreation and Parks and LAUSD. Um, and what what uh, our Partnerships Division is asking for is a little bit more time to be able to put together their final report. They did Good. submit so a when preliminary it's ready, we'll report. Schedule it for council. I'm sorry? When it's ready, we'll schedule it for right. council. They're putting together a final report. They've already submitted a preliminary report. Got and it. They can so continue we'll look at that. that and then we'll so we approve this and we're going to note and file it, but send it to council. Yes. Uh, yes. But we'll tell you what date when they're ready. Next item. Okay. Next item is item number 10, and that is the motion of Bon Chan relative to the CAO chairing a meeting with LAUSD, Los Angeles Community College District, Los Angeles County and City slash County Recreation and Parks to discuss better joint use agreements, identify a multi-agency task force to determine best use practices, and a report on its findings. So we're going to give that to the CAO's office. Uh, Mr. Reagan, because you know, you have baseball fields. Right. LA Unified has baseball fields. Community College has. How can we all work together? It's all the same people's money, right, Mr. Reyes? So we're going to give you the CAO, recommend approval, <laughs> and they'll come back later on. Uh, Councilman, just for the record, because this task force uh, specifically uh, delineated who's to be on the task force, this body will be subject to the Brown Act. Very good. Thank you so much. Next item. Uh, 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 Mr. Chair, so this is approved, just yeah. for the record? Okay. Approved for the record. Next item is item number 11, and that is motion LaBonge Garcetti relative to requesting the Department of Recreation and Parks to develop a park ranger explorer program to allow young adults to participate in ranger-related training activities. So I should have had a motion before to direct you to get a chief park ranger. That's not on here today on any of this. Unfortunately, no. Because we have an acting right. uh, uh, assignment from general services. But we need to look at the ways to get more youth involved with a great program. If LAPD has a cadet explorer program, we should have it. You agree? I agree. You know, we've... Uh, you know, your your, motion, your former motion did ask us to put together a junior ranger program, and you know we've done that. And we have right. a very vibrant, um, very effective junior ranger. How program. many junior we rangers do you have? Just finished up. It's not a. It's not a. It's not like an explorer program. <clears throat> right. A junior ranger is an educational component of our interpretive unit. Right. And what we've done is we've developed a series of classes that uh, we take out to the recreation centers. We just finished a great summer, not only uh, at the summer day camps, providing these classes. Some of them have to do with insects. Some have to do with camping skills. We've taken kids up to Chileo Flats in the in the uh, Angeles National Forest. So what we're going to do here, Kevin, on these two items, I'm going to continue these two for the new chair. Where's what's the third one, Lisa? Um, the the. Oh, the all, I'm going to all these things on the range. I'm going to leave it for the new committee. We're going to continue it for the new committee uh, uh, and take it up. I think Ms. Dodge made some questions earlier about this issue, uh, so that will give time to work on. I'm passionate, should be a chief park ranger of the ranger division. I'm passionate about the rangers, but in order to get this done correctly, I'm going to leave it to the new committee. I'll meet with Mr. Kokorian and Mr. Reyes to ask that we consider this. We have more time and maybe we can bring people sure. in. Thank you very much. Next item. Next item is item number 14, and that is motion LaBonge Alarcon Garcetti relative to requesting Department of Recreation and Parks with the assistance of Film LA, Inc. to report on the process and how well the uh, department is equipped and ready to assist and facilitate the film productions in city parks and facilities. The Jobs and Business Development Committee received and filed this matter on July 27, 2010. So, Councilman, just real quick, because I know you're in a hurry, we have Mark Carbon here uh, of our uh, Park Film Office. Works very closely with Film LA, does all of our film permits in the parks, does a great job. We're happy to answer any questions you may have. We're not sure exactly what questions you may have on this item. Tell us. Give us a report. Uh, good morning. Uh, as far as communication has been our strongest uh, effort, with Film LA, we do quarterly meetings with uh, citywide departments. Film LA uh, location managers are, are involved, 
and uh, that's to talk about what the uh, issues for the location managers in the industry has been and what our city departments, uh, recreation and parks particularly, can do to assist them in. Uh, so is it working lot, well? It's, it's in, had a lot of progressive improvements. Any complaints the from the public? Uh, there's always a few complaints from the Give public regarding few. filming. Uh, it's primarily an interference with uh, noise. Uh -huh. uh, from an uh, equipment standpoint, uh, filming that is within the park is usually not an issue. Uh, it's normally uh, street parking uh, issues that pertain to the Department of Transportation. In the park. Within the park. In the park. So. That's correct. Got it. Mr. Reyes, uh, uh, please, your advice. Just, uh, do we still have any uh, productions that are not permitted that happen spontaneously in our parks? Do we ever get... Uh, any citations or folks that are being essentially slapped in the hand for doing production in our parks without permits? There are a number of runaway films, uh, film companies that do film in the parks without a permit, uh, as well as photography. Uh, it's primarily uh, student groups uh, from our colleges. Uh, it seems it appears that almost every college has a film department, and uh, Film LA has made a tremendous effort in communicating to the various schools what the rules are. But no major, ex no major explosions and no, sir. Uh, special effects. We want to help, no, need, we, we, we we students. help students. We would need involvement from LAPD and, and other departments. We, should special effects. In the district, we had several incidents where at 2 in the morning you have an explosion in the Asian Park. It was a scene for a film, etc. So I'm just hoping it's not happening. We're not continuing. Right. I think that, yeah, it, what, Councilman, I understand what you're referring to, and I think that sometimes there are some disconnects or some misunderstandings between community members and what's actually been permitted. Sometimes community members feel that they know what's been permitted when actually something was permitted. They say it wasn't. Whose so, website is it on, like if someone wanted to know? Like if they're filming in Griffin Park today, is it on anybody's website? Uh, Film LA, uh, uh -huh. Film LA website. The permits are available to the general public. Maybe we should have a link. Let's look at having a link to some of that. We could look Thank at that. Thank you very much. So we note and file this. Next item. Item number 15 is motion Weezer Labange Grohl relative to requesting the general manager of El Pueblo to review and identify space to create a rent-to-bike facility at the heart of okay. the city adjacent to Union Station. Okay, go ahead, please. Good morning. I'm Diana martinez Lilly, the assistant general manager with the Department of El Pueblo. I'm, I'll make it brief. We are working diligently with the, the Chinatown BID and other uh, historic neighborhood councils to develop a transportation plan. We have identified a few sites that would be... What are the sites? Actually, Union Station is just okay. perked up as one of the possibilities because MTA Mr. owns Reyes, it. Mr. Martinez yes. uh, spoke to me at the city's birthday, and I was uh, very uh, uh, aggressive in trying to get her to get this bike thing going. Now the MTA has bought Union Station. It would be ideal for them to do it there. I just want... People from Metrolink or the Orange Line, right. Gold Line, but, take it into town and rent a bike. But the pivotal question here is, given the uh, LADOT's master plan, the bike. We're plan, using that, yes. Okay, given that, and given the planning department's designation for special zones for this purpose, yes. are we moving in that direction so that we can identify geographically strategic locations? Absolutely, yes. And yeah. we have those locations already cited? Well, the, we, we have to do a feasibility study with regard to safety. The problem with our site, as you know, some of the areas that are open leave um, it a little vulnerable in terms of crossing, uh, particularly Father Sarah Park, which is close to Union Station. The only cross, uh, the way to cross, although people do illegally, is at Alameda or Arcadia. But the next is here is the Gold Line, which is in Chinatown, which is yes. like four or five blocks away. Yes. And then you have, obviously, the Union Station across the street. Yes. So in the park itself, can we facilitate that triangle? Yes, absolutely we are. Um, as you know, Chinatown BID has even looked into offering free bikes with low jack that then could be identified. So you could get a bike in Chinatown at the right. Gold Line station, and you could ride around Chinatown or El Pueblo and come back and return your bike. On the Internet, if you go to Sevilla, Spain, yes. they've 
the municipality there already has a system in place. Long you Beach does. You don't have to create Long Beach. They have a great. So you don't have to recreate the wheel. So how far are we? Well, as I said, we we need to make sure that safety is you know overriding all of these issues. And are we months, years? No, probably about three or four months because we have to coordinate with all the different council, um, you know, historic neighborhood council and etc. I know you're in a hurry, so and also we would like to look at other m modes of transportation. So a great New Year's gift for the ride, council member here. Well, for, yeah. A great yeah. New Year's gift for the council member would be for him we to be bi it. park his yes. bike in there. Yes. Right. And, okay. So and. I just want to thank you for coming to the city's birthday. Yay, 230 years. And also for all your great work. I'm sorry to see that you're not going to be chairing this. You've been a real friend oh, no. to, well, the, to the people of Los Angeles. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much for your nice comments. We'll talk to you, Diane. All right. Next, uh, we're going to note and file that. Okay. Note and file it, but send it to council so we get that same report. I don't just, let's just go to 19. The CAO recommend a, a, a approval of, of both reports. Go to 19. Call 19. Item Please. number 19 is a uh, chief legislative analyst and CAO reports yeah, relative to pre-race progress yeah, reports close, for 2010-2011 right? Los Angeles marathons. Okay, so uh, just give us that report. Uh, good morning, Veronica Salumbidas with the Office of the CAO. Um, the CLA and the CAO recommend um, that you note and file both uh, reports. Okay, but there is going to be a marathon next year. There is going to be one in March. And we're working and everything's going okay. Yes, you will receive a pre-race progress report for the 2012 um, marathon event. Interesting. Okay, so we want one. We want one. Very good. Thank you so much. Okay, before you close, Mr. Okay. Chair, I just want to make wait, wait, sure. Wait, 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 I got to do two more. Okay, so two more. 19, 19, we did. 18, let's continue that with the volunteer uh, to Mr. Koretz. Okay, 17. Item number 17 is communication from the County of Los Angeles Department of Auditor Controller relative to quarterly uh, accountability of funds report for Olive View Medical Center for yes. fiscal year 2010-11. Right. Tell the people in the back, Lisa, the, the, their noise is bumping right up. Okay, this is the uh, uh, user report from Olive View that dates back to the uh, building of that. So, therefore... We're going to note and file this. Is that all right, Sharon? Uh, you are note and filing number 17, yes. Right, good. And let's go to 16. Number 16 is the last item, and that is Motion LaBonge Wesson relative to American with Disabilities Act public accommodation compliance requirements for private businesses. Let's continue this because uh, I want to uh, give very good focus on that. Does that complete our motion, all our activity? Uh, Mr. Chair, that clears the desk. However, you had a public comment yeah, card. Dr. Williams. And he is no not here. here. So, no, file. So, Rex, did you have a comment? Okay. No Councilman LaBonge, on 19, did you note and file 19? Yeah, or did you? 19, did. 19 was noted. No so, so, Mr. Chair, how long were you chair of this committee? I think about seven years. Or seven so. years. Yeah. A lot has been done thanks to your leadership, your stewardship. Uh, there's a lot of heart that you bring to this position. I think the community folks, whether there's tension or not, they know you come from a good place, a good heart, and it shows in all your productivity and the goodwill that you produce, not only in the staff here, but also throughout the whole community. So congratulations to you, sir, and uh, great job, Tom. Mr. Reyes, I could do without you. You're a champion of the river, which hopes one day gets folded into this committee, because the river should be part of a park. And our city clerks, city attorneys, legislative analysts, and city administrative offices all help me, including council staff. And I want to thank Lisa Schechter especially for that. And now I have to adjourn the meeting. Okay. <laughs>